Good morning. <laughs> it's still morning. Good morning. I'm Ann Henderson, Director of Education and Community Engagement here at the Frist Center. And it's my pleasure to welcome you here on behalf of um, the, the institution here. We are delighted to be partnering with Nashville Civic Design Center in, this Nash, in the Urban Design Forum series. And so we are delighted to have you all here today. Um, and I would be remiss if I did not thank um, one of the great pleasures of the, of the Frist Center is that we're able to have these partnerships and bring in different people to speak and really bring in a diverse crowd and a diverse programming for us. So we are very appreciative of this and bringing in with Gary to partner with us and bring this in today. So we're excited about that. We are also appreciative to Metro Arts, the Tennessee Arts Commission, and the National Endowment for the Arts for their ongoing support of the Frist Center here and all their support that makes these types of programs possible. So with that said, I'm going to turn this over to Gary Gaston. Thank you so much, Anne. Uh, thank you for joining us today. Uh, the Civic Design Center's mission is to elevate the quality of the built environment in Nashville and to promote public participation in that process to help create a more beautiful and functional city for everyone. So uh, you being here and the, the work that uh, you're helping us do in Nashville is, is helping promote that mission. Uh, we're thrilled to be here in partnership with the Frist Center for the Visual Arts, who has uh, graciously partnered with us in hosting numerous events throughout the past year, and we have an exciting calendar of events coming up in 2018 as well. Uh, just to touch on a few of our immediate upcoming events, we have uh, the Civic Design Center hosts, hosts Pachakcha Night, which is a fun uh, event that has uh, 20 slides, 20 seconds, uh, speakers, about 10 speakers each uh, quarter. And our upcoming program is, uh, you've, you've heard Nashville called the It City. This is the information technology focused uh, Pachakcha Night with presenters that take that angle on design. We also have in March a tactical urbanism focused uh, urban design forum, which will be hosted in the nations in a factory, uh, old warehouse building that's actually uh, in the process of being converted to uh, its ultimate use, but in about a 90 day time span will be a temporary pop up art uh, collector space so that uh, we can kind of insert some activity into that in its interim use. We also have our transit uh, in partnership with Transit Now Nashville. Uh, for an upcoming transit mixer, which will be focused on the idea of the tunnel along First Avenue. This will be hosted in Woolworth on 5th, which is also a historic uh, site uh, of the sit-ins that occurred at uh, the Woolworth building historically. So it'll be great to see that. It's going to be in the basement, so it's symbolic of uh, the, the tunnel idea that's going to be happening in, uh, in Nashville along First Avenue, or 5th uh, Avenue, hopefully. Uh, we are in the process of finalizing, t actually tonight is the last uh, showing of Letters to the Mayor exhibition, which will be coming down, but there will be a publication of all the letters that were written uh, where 100 architects were asked to uh, write a letter to the mayor about their ideas and vision for what should happen or sh uh, is not happening in Nashville, and that will be reflected in the publication which will come out this spring. So if you were a letter writer, I'm curious how many maybe in the audience wrote a letter as a part of that exhibition, if you could raise your hand. Okay, so quite a few. Uh, if you wrote a letter to that, we'd love for you to uh, help us uh, contribute to funding the publication, or if your company supported that process, uh, we are seeking funds for that. So feel free to reach out to uh, Fuller Hannon, who is the, uh, the curator, or anyone at the Design Center could tell you more. Um, and uh, we encourage you all to be active supporters of both the Frist Center and the Nashville Civic Design Center and become a member of hopefully both organizations to help us both support our mission and what we do. Civic Design Center just kicked off its spring membership campaign. And uh, if you're not currently a member, I'd ask you to do so. Uh, we'd also like to recognize our presenting sponsors for the year, Mars Pet Care LP Building Products, as well as our program sponsor, ESA as well as Perkins and Will. Uh, Don Reynolds is here who has been uh, active in Nashville and involved with the Civic Design Center for many years and it was very gracious of him to help um, actually set up uh, and arrange for us to be able to host this uh, presentation today 
um, with Zena. So uh, we're thrilled to welcome Zena Howard, who uh, will be giving a presentation on uh, many projects that she's worked on. But seeing as this is Black History Month, I think it's also very exciting to hear a focused presentation on the Smithsonian's institution, uh, institution's National Museum of African American History and Culture. Um, which is located on the mall in DC. And I have not had yet a chance to visit the interior. I've seen it from the outside uh, before it was open. So that is definitely on my list of travel destinations this year. Um, had a wonderful opportunity this morning to get to, to meet and have coffee with Zena. And um, also want to uh, recognize the fact, uh, welcome you to Nashville. And also, I know it's been five years, I think, since you were last here, so there's a lot of change that's happened in the city. And also let everyone know that last night she received the wonderful, very well-deserved uh, news. So we want to congratulate you on your AIA College of Fellows recognition, the elevation that happened, that you found out about last night. Uh, this is the highest recognition that's given to an architect in the profession, so uh, wonderful news. And we were also joined uh, by another uh, esteemed individual, uh, Henry Beecher Hicks III, who I actually had the pleasure of getting to know and becoming friends with during Leadership Nashville back in 2010. And um, Henry is here today, is joining us as well. He is the president and CEO of the National Museum of African American Music and uh, has a brief introduction to give and tell us about the current status of your project. Thank you. Yes. Well, good morning, everyone. How are you? I was excited, uh, as Gary mentioned, to, to join uh, him and to join uh, Zena for breakfast uh, coffee this morning. And uh, it was a joy to meet you and to spend some time talking. and. Uh, I'm really excited to be here um, today, and uh, Zena is, uh, of course, an architect with more than 25 years of experience, and we just heard about her elevation. Um, she specializes in, in uh, LEED uh, certified uh, facilities, but really, um, you know, it, it, it really struck me that um, there was something I was reading a little bit about her that um, I wanted to share with you all um, that really kind of inspired me. And I know uh, our, our architect for the museum, which is under construction, is Harold Thompson with Thompson & Associates. And we're under construction downtown. It's really exciting. He and I spend a lot of time uh, talking about you know, what it means, actually, to, to build this museum. And so I read this, this phrase that uh, in an article that said, the building's inverted ziggurat shape is one aspect that holds significance to Howard. Angling upwards toward the sky, it's meant to be uplifting an image of hope and resiliency with a shape reminiscent of crowns in some West African cultures. For Howard, it's an empowering image. And I, and I suppose, isn't that what our work is all about? Empowering, uh, and creating empowering images, empowering places, um, empowering um, experiences in our lives. Um, and that's certainly what we are working hard to do at the National Museum of African American Music. And I'm, I was so uh, pleased not only to, to read that that was a big part of the inspiration for her work uh, with the National Museum of African American History and Culture, and then also to learn, of course, as we spent time this morning, I, it really comes out in, uh, in the conversation that we had this morning, and I'm sure we'll hear more of that as she gives, gives us her thoughts and reflections today. So with that, I'm pleased to welcome my new friend, Zena Howard. Well, thank you, and good afternoon. Um, such a pleasure to be here, and we did have a wonderful breakfast this morning with Gary and Mr. Hicks, so it, um, it was a pleasure to spend time with you all. And um, I'm very happy to be here. It has been a while since I've been in Nashville, and my, uh, it has changed, and is continuing to change. So um, it's great to, to see the level of development that's occurring here. So I'm going to talk to you guys today. I'm going to um, focus a bit, a large part of my presentation on the National Museum of African American History and Culture. And then I want to give you a little uh, preview into what 
is happening next and where um, we're taking this whole notion of um, cultural expression in the built environment. And, um, and I'm also going to ask my colleague, Don, and I actually thank him for arranging everything here, but to keep me on time, I want to make sure I leave uh, about 10 minutes at the end um, to uh, take some questions that you guys may have. Um, so we'll start talking about uh, this project that you see on the screen that is actually um, 100 years in the making. Uh, it was funny, we were talking this morning about how long it takes for these um, projects that have such strong vision, um, but oftentimes start with very limited resources and also, in many instances, policies and um, working against um, the, the uh, actual realization of these. So this one was 100 years. So I want to walk you through that, because it's important to understand, why, whereas I spent you know eight, or at this point, nearly 10 years um, of my life on this project, it was actually 100 years in the making. And it started in 1916, when African American Civil War veterans marched in Washington, um, asking for something to commemorate their contributions uh, to the Civil War. So fast forward, um, not too long in 1929, uh, a few years later, um, legislation was authorized actually to, to build this museum. Um, and the exact verbiage you see on the screen was it was to be a monument that contributed to the Negroes' contributions um, to the achievements of America. But then it took 75 years because um, as most of us know, you can pass legislation uh, in, in Congress, uh, but nothing really happens until funding is available. So the legislation sat um, unfunded until 2001 when the congressman from Georgia, uh, Congressman Lewis, uh, as you, most of you know, picked up the charge um, and, and actually formed a commission, uh, a plan for action, presidential commission established that. Um, then in 2003, George W. Bush um, was actually, took action to actually fund this and um, signed um, the uh, act authorizing the creation of for the Smithsonian uh, Museum to, uh, a, a consortium of museums to take this on. Um, momentum really started picking up at this point. In 2004, Smithsonian's Board of Regents named 19 key people um, to its board. And many of you know um, Ken Chenault, American Express, Oprah Winfrey, um, Linda Johnson-Rice. So there were some really prominent people um, that were bought on to help fuel the momentum. Um, at that point, um, a very, another very strategic decision was made to bring um, Lonnie Bunch on uh, and a tremendous force, a visionary, um, a, a accomplished fundraiser, uh, and um, uh, a, a wonderful historian. Uh, so he was named founding director of the museum. And then um, a huge milestone here where the site for the museum was selected. And we're going to talk a little bit, I'm going to talk a little bit more about this site. But um, again, acquiring this particular location um, all in, in itself was a, was a huge achievement. So um, a little bit about my history. I, uh, I have been working in the cultural market um, uh, uh, with uh, Phil Freeland for 15 years. So I actually joined the Freeland group 15 years ago and became co-leader um, in building this cultural market. And so in 2007, we, prior to, uh, we were known as Freelon prior to being acquired by per Perkins and Will, um, teamed with um, Max Bond, another at that time prominent um, African American architect working out of New York. And we did programming for the museum and um, we completed a 1,200 page um, documents, six volumes, that really prescribed um, sort of the, um, the quantitative qualities, but uh, the, the qualitative qualities of, of this museum and how we sort of envision it, set the entire framework really for the design. Moving on from that, um, we thought that after we did that wonderful job with programming that Smithsonian would just hire us to do the building. Um, they did not. They decided to do an international design competition. So we then said, OK, we, we will compete. We did um, compete, and, um, and I'll share a little bit of that uh, process with you in a minute. And um, in 2009, we were selected as the winner 
of that competition. And uh, in 2012, we broke ground. Um, you see there uh, uh, Laura Bush, who, is, who was and continues to be a huge supporter of the museum. And we started construction in 2013. So that brings us to where we are today. Um, when we did the programming study, um, we, uh, we did vis visitation estimates. And at that time, our estimates did project that this would be one of the most popular museums in America. Um, we projected annual at attendance uh, year one, um, of course peaking, but, um, but year one through five of two and a half to three million folks a year. And we pretty much exceeded that in the first year. And so uh, I know, don't ask me for passes because everybody does. <laughs> but uh, hopefully one day, um, you know, the, the visitation will, will be such that there won't be passes uh, needed um, to control the flow through the museum. So I want to talk a little bit about the site. Um, this is one of, uh, this is not only um, a very prominent site, um, you can see here it is literally, uh, obviously you know what that is, that's the White House. Um, it sits here right at the base of the Washington Monument. Um, when we started this project, we started, you know, as architects, we started thinking really contextually about what we were dealing with. And so when we looked at the site, it is actually um, sort of at a hinge point. We actually call it a, a kind of a hinge site because to the east is the very formal um, uh, development of, of the, um, the ground, the uh, uh, Washington um, Mall. And to the west is the Washington Monument grounds and those um, aspects of that is that it's really more of a rolling bucolic landscape. So, the site had a little bit of an identity crisis. We said, how do you develop such a site like this? Does it really want to relate more to uh, the formal east side or the more informal and flowing west side? The other thing that we pondered when we started the, the design competition is um, the, the location. It is literally at the center of very, very key monuments. Um, the, the, the site is almost what we say, it's, it's almost like a sacred location because you know you have the White House, um, you have the Capitol, you have the, the Lincoln Jefferson, and at this time, the MLK Memorial was not yet built. We knew that would be the site for it, um, but that opened in, in 2011. And then you have its closest neighbor, the Washington um, Monument. So, uh, in consultation um, with, uh, with, with many, many stakeholders after we won the competition, we determined that this five acre site um, really, really could, should not be overdeveloped. And it really should respond more to what you see in the White House ellipse and the Washington Monument grounds. Um, so in order to accomplish that, we had to think critically about um, how you minimally develop a site that has a huge program uh, and, and still have some prominence or presence to it. What we decided to do, this is just a cross section, and most of any of you that have been in the building, we put 60% of the building below grade. Um, and there was a lot of negotiations with the stakeholder uh, that we were dealing with, and there were many. Uh, there was the U.S. Commission of Fine Arts, the National Capital Planning Commission, uh, the U.S. Secret Service, the um, you know Save Our Mall people. There were there were lots of constituents, and so we did decide that um, if we could put more of the building below grade, it would actually be an advantage to the site, and I'll show you why. So this was our uh, an early artistic um, uh, rendering that we did um, with with making sure that the northern part of the site really remained as open as possible. This is the Federal Triangle here to the north and protecting those views back through to the Washington Monument grounds was key to the success of this design. Um, and then in another way in which we sort of, we knew that the building will be distinct and so I'll talk about how we got to that point of the, the way it looks in a minute. But it also needed to be um, 
hugely respectful of this place. It's not every day that you're building something on one of our national treasures or that you're even allowed to do that. So one of the ways um, in which this building has a subtle gesture towards its closest neighbor is actually, if you look at, at its form, at, at its geometry and plan, it's a square form, very similar to, to the um, Washington Monument. Um, this is an aerial photograph. This was actually um, in, uh, during construction. But the other way in which we paid respect to this place was our alignments. We paid close attention to uh, this is American history, obviously, to the east. These uh, red cap buildings are always the Federal Triangle buildings, very uh, prominent and noted by their, their um, red tile roofs. Uh, but we, we wanted to make sure that, um, that we respected key alignments and, and relationships with those buildings. This is, again, um, that building, the Commerce Building, that you would see uh, in, in a, um, you will see in another photograph. We actually kept the parapet of, of our building um, below the parapet of the, of the Commerce Building. And so this is the final photography. You can see that, that's that commerce building. So the building is actually, our development is actually pushed down in close relationship, clearly respecting its context. This is the photograph where we pick up and relate very, very closely to um, the rolling uh, landscape here. I mentioned that 60% of the building is above, below grade. So what we did was we just mounded the earth and um, we set this building up high and mounded the earth, and uh, that allowed the ability to actually roll the landscape and relate more. And um, another subtle gesture that we did in talking about, I'm gonna, going to talk about this part of the building, which we call and refer to as the corona, was when we were thinking about this angled form, um, it was important to us, again, to relate to our context, so it's actually tilted the exact angle of the Washington Monument, that 17.4 degree angle. Um, it matches it exactly, again, as a, as, a, as a nod there. So that's sort of, sort of the sighting and context. Um, what I want to talk about now is how the thinking that went behind um, the form and the materiality and the, and the vertical expression. This was an, a rendering that we did um, early on. Um, so what uh, when we actually won the competition or started the competition, it was in January of 2009. We actually notified in December 2008 that we were one of six teams selected. And we met um, right after the holidays, in, um, shortly after in January. And at that time, um, President Barack Obama had just been uh, elected uh, to his first inauguration as president. And so we all brought to that charrette, we, which is, a, you know, most of you know what a shred is, but that uh, work session, images that we thought um, should resonate in the building. So this is a compilation of, of many of those images. You see here on the lower uh, left, that is, um, that was actually taken like the week before we were meeting, literally the week after the inauguration. And that is an image of uh, people celebrating on the mall right after that um, inauguration of that, and that ex uh, sort of physical expression of uplifting hands and what people do when they're happy, when they're celebratory. Um, and, and we all tend to do that. So that was something that, that resonated with us. There were also, uh, images about light and, and how light moves through the building and how you can focus light in the building to achieve uh, certain objectives. So we were inspired by um, the movement of, of light, natural and artificial. Um, there were also images of, a, of agrarian concepts um, such as farming and, and porches, you know, which were very um, special in many ways to African Americans, uh, particularly in the South. Um, and I, I grew up in the South too, so um, we used our porches um, quite a bit. And they were more than just a, a space that navigated between the, um, or mitigated between the interior and external environment. They were really um, places that were a celebration of community and, um, and social uh, life. But one of the most more inspiring images that was brought forth is this one to the right. Um, and so this was our design team was a team of four architectural firms. 
Um, my firm, the Freelon Group, was the lead, uh, lead firm. Um, and David Age, or Age Associates, um, was the lead design firm as well. So David actually bought um, a very healthy West African sensibility to, to this project. And so this figure in West African architecture and art is called a karyotid. And um, it, what's familiar to us about this is that it has the traditional base, um, the column and the capital that most of our architectural elements have. But a signature piece of the work karyotid is the uh, corona form that's um, on top of the head. So this, this sort of a you know, three-tier form um, was, was really inspiring to us. So um, these are early sketches um, that you know, were generated actually uh, as part during the charrette by David. And what's shown here is this notion of a, a karyotid or a crown. And the idea that a crown sits upon one's head and we like the idea of lifting a crown-like form and enshrouding the content, the precious content, uh, the exhibits, the artifacts that would be collected through the museum, sort of um, enshrouding those in a, in a crown above one's head. So that was something that, um, that we knew was important. This sketch kind of, kind of uh, codifies that if you lift up the content of the museum and then um, allow that corona form to surround that content and possibly circulate then between the, those two volumes. That, that was very intriguing to us. So we thought a lot about form, okay? So once you have form, um, what about materiality? And for that, we drew um, inspiration. Really, we looked to the southern parts of America, places like um, Charleston, New Orleans, Savannah, places that most of us are very familiar with um, because we generally uh, live down here. But um, we looked at the ironwork that you see here on the screen. Most of this ironwork, or much of it, was done by African American craftsmen. And that was a story that had never really been put forth in a very public way. So um, this ironwork is beautiful, you know, with its, with its grapes, its leaves. Um, but it also had a very practical purpose of shading, as you see here on the balcony. And you appreciate that when, when you are in um, particularly New Orleans. I was just there a couple weeks ago. And, um, and it really is um, quite a beautiful expression on these balconies. So we took that concept, <laughs> excuse me, I'm glad I have two waters up here. So we thought about that concept of how do you take something that was so intricately and, 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 and a lot of detail and craft was put into it, not mimic it, we certainly don't want to do that, but think about ex, uh, abstracting that into a modern interpretation. So this is a, an early sketch of how we thought we might um, do that. We also thought that once we did this and looked at this very um, you know, abstract um, expression, that we still had a building that needed to, to function in many ways. It needed, it had four sides, so the sun and solar aspects would be very different on all four sides. So we looked at modulating the porosity of, of this um, screen this, and so that we can get um, very, very open areas, but also close down uh, the, uh, the porosity a bit. And that allowed us to do one thing, modulate, as I said, um, very practical aspects such as solar gain and heat gain, but also to privilege views in and out of the building where we wanted to. So we studied that. This was actually a study model we did in studio, you know, we begin to study that and how that, how that could work. Again, you're seeing that space here between the exhibit box and, and that external screen. But <clears throat> that was one level of study. We took it to the next level of study where we, we did um, full um, miniature built models and um, looked at the impact, you can see it here, of just variegating or modulating those panels and arranging them so that they are not consistent across um, any one side. And also how 
um, artificial light works with that. That wasn't quite enough for us, so we did a, um, a full-scale mock-up of one of the tiers. We went out to York, Pennsylvania and decided to build this, um, <clears throat> this uh, mock-up, and we actually were able to view this over the course of several days in different types of, um, of uh, environmental conditions, uh, overcast sun, but also we looked at the interior here. And um, actually, I'm, I'm in this photograph, uh, so I provide some sense of scale. So what you see is that, you know, the glass or the curtain wall that's there in front of us. And we were able to test things like light, like how do you light something that's largely porous, you know? And um, we, this is where we came up with the notion of actually putting a, a uh, very discreet, hopefully you guys don't recognize, generally people don't recognize it when they're out there, but we have a frit pattern on the glass, and so we're able to cast light down against the glass and basically silhouette the corona against um, a backlit glass piece. And so, <clears throat> This is actually the, the effect of, of that. Um, on the inside of the building, we kept the, the, um, the surfaces very simple, the color pad palette very simple, because we knew that you would get a lot of movement and dappling of light all throughout the day on these surfaces as you move between the space, between the corona and the exhibit boxes. And this is another photograph where you see, where you're kind of looking out now, and you can see the porosity and, and you maintain the views. Um, you're always connected to your environment, and that was one of the things that were important to us, because as you design museums, they can be very immersive in experiences. You want that. You want the, the visitor to become engaged in the content and the learning and the didactic or, or experience that they're having. Um, but in this museum, we took a different approach. Because of its location, we wanted to constantly remind people where they were um, in, in the context of our National Mall. So then that brought us to kind of the, the exterior of the skin, skin, the coloration. So we, we sort of have a unique form, right? Uh, if you've ever been on the mall prior to this building, you didn't really see um, buildings that, uh, that were formed like this. Most of them are, are largely neoclassical. The materiality is um, you know, marble, limestone, um, and the roofs are clay tile roofs or something else. So um, <clears throat> we thought a lot about um, the, the coloring, and um, we knew from the beginning that we wanted the building to be bronze, not only because it's a handsome, stately um, color, uh, but uh, it also would allow the pe people to experience the building differently during different times of day. So on a very, very sunny day, you may get a brassy kind of experience. Um, on an overcast day, the building goes kind of dark, and that's really cool as well. But um, then at night, when it's lit, you, have, um, you always have this kind of gently glowing um, uh, expression right there on the mall. This is actually a photograph that was taken. Um, we, we opened this project on a Saturday, so this was taken by an iPhone. Somebody took it as people were lined up um, going in, that we had an evening celebration. And so you could see that um, we were very pleased about how um, the building really is just kind of this gentle filigree. And um, I included this image here because um, <clears throat> there was a lot of uh, study that we did on, on the mall and, and the way the, the, the entire mall is lit. Uh, and how our building should stand out from that. Um, we have restrictions that say nothing. The most heavily, the, the uh, heaviest lit elements on the mall is the U.S. Capitol on one end, and of course the Washington Monument on the other. But in between, um, it, it really is just a, a hodgepodge of, of inconsistent lighting. You get hot spots. I always say, I wish we set out of this project, the next project should do to should be to do a complete lighting study on the mall and, and just really get a wonderful feeling there. But what we decided for this building was that it should be a gentle glow. It should not um, be careful not to overshadow anything. So that, that's what you see here. It's really not upstaging anything, um, but um, hopefully, we hope at some point in the future, um, 
the lighting uh, on the mall will be improved. So um, the next element I want to talk about is the porch. Um, I shared with you that that was very, you know, that this building really is a melding of the West African and Southern American uh, sensibilities and, um, and, the, and how community and culture was expressed in those different um, areas of, our, um, con of the continent, each continent. So this is an, an early sketch that we did. Um, we knew we wanted a porch. Because, and we knew we wanted it on the south side, which, um, you know, from an environmental standpoint is, is uh, the harshest side. So, but we wanted an overly exaggerated expression of a porch. So this early um, sketch shows a pretty much 60 foot deep um, porch from the back tilt to the, to the knife edge. Again, that angular gesture going up um, because Everything about this building, um, regardless of what you experience, uh, what you, in terms of a deep history that may not be all positive, the um, perseverance of this people in terms of, um, of persistence is always there. So there was always hope, and we liked that gesture of, of having hope. So the other thing that we did, we have a water feature that I'll talk about here at the at the. Uh, base of the building and this was um, also special because we thought water in terms of what it means to African Americans and, and used in different ways was special. A lot of uh, most Africans came to this country by crossing over through water so the, the introduction of water in this building was was very important but the key thing is that the overlap of the porch and the water feature below to us um, creates a little bit of a microclimate and a cooling effect also on the south um, side of the building, which um, in, the, in the summertime could be fairly harsh. So this was our rendition of what we imagined would happen. Um, we also wanted a combination of very still and moving water. Um, and again, that was symbolic of the, the journey of many people, not just African American people, but um, there's never a moment in time where it's all one or the other. Different themes occur at the same time. There's war in times of, where other people are experiencing peace. There were enslaved Africans at the same time that they were freed. So we like this sort of um, juxtaposition of, of um, moving in still water to kind of symbolize that. So this is the, the photography that you see here where the water here exists very still. The porch is, uh, knife edge is extending over that, but then the water moves across a series of quotes um, at the top that you can see a little bit um, more closely here. And a gesturing back out to the, the landscape. This is uh, photography of, of what um, we hoped we would capture. So the porch really is, stands, to, you know, separate from the corona. It is its own thing. And um, it is a, like I said, a, a 60 foot cantilever, um, but it's a 180 foot clear span. And it's um, just, just a expression that on the end, when we detailed the end pieces, we wanted to pick up some of the angles, forms that were happening there in a more graceful uh, manner, not necessarily the exact same angle that, that's on the corona, but the, um, the different materiality that was used on the porch with the clad stone and the um, this sort of um, metaled uh, corona we thought um, was, was very nice. And you can see it in the, in the um, Final photography here, where the porch really is just um, an exaggerated modern expression of something that um, that most uh, people can relate to. So, in talking about how you move through the building, this was an early map that we did from our uh, programming. Those two years of programming that I told you about that uh, we we did we provided, but. <clears throat> The experience really starts at the Grand Central Hall when you enter here, and this is an example. And it was very, very important to us that that Central Hall be glass 
all around. So imagine really this whole building, it's very simply designed if you think about it as a, as a glass box. It's, it's, you know, it's really a glass block, box. There's some closed in um, panels somewhere, but it's, it's, it's a box with almost like a lampshade the corona just kind of hanging over it. And we actually did build, the building is actually built from the top down. So we actually hang the corona down um, over this box. But we did not want to cover um, this first level because we wanted you, when you entered the building, to always have this connection back to the landscape. So that's the corona lifted up. Um, for those artists in the fan, in the, uh, or in the room, this is a, or fans of, uh, I could say that, of John Hunt. This is his piece of sculpture that's, that's hanging there in the museum. Fantastic piece that uh, he did, uh, we commissioned for this particular project. And here you can see, again, that, that 15 foot glass and the connections back to, that's that commerce building in the Federal Triangle looking north there. Another piece for art fans, that's Shakaya Booker's piece. Um, she does a lot of work out of, out of tires. And um, then you begin from this level, you begin to move down. And as you traverse down in the building, um, this is one of the ways we provided a grand, um, what we call a, a monumental staircase, a curved linear form. It's one of the ways to get you down to the building but you're really going down to, to begin um, the history gallery experience. So the way the building is organized, we felt strongly that when you entered the building, you should have the history, the deep history that's a little bit more mutable below you. So you, you drop 85 feet down to begin that experience, but it's really 400 years in history because it starts, the story starts with the transatlantic slave period. And above you, on that corona is actually just two simple galleries. It's community and culture, because those are the things that um, are never immutable. They're always um, reinventing themselves and always progressing. So you begin this journey down. Um, this was a, an artist rendition where we imagined at that point um, digging deep, and we dug, and I, I know you've been digging for your building for quite some time. Uh, we dug for over two years as well. People thought, are they really building something over there? But that was because we felt it was really, really important to, to dig deep enough to get a volume of space where we could um, show those themes that I talked about happening at the same time. Like here, you see a, a segregated rail car, which I'll show, talk about in a minute. Um, and then this is the period of the antebellum period. So you see, you know, the 1960-era train car in the same perspective that you experience um, other things such as antebellum. And people always ask me, so I always show it, how uh, the train car got in the building. So there is, um, this was pretty fantastic, and uh, two 500-ton cranes working in tandem. To, uh, to, they found this rail car, moved it, restored it, moved it here. It took about uh, nearly two years to restore it and dropped it in place. And this is the finished photograph that you could see the rail car along with, at the same time, um, Smithsonian acquired a uh, prison tower from the um, infamous Angola prison. And so we were able to get those artifacts in. Um, I should pause here to say that um, it would be wonderful and beautiful when you know we're brought in to design a project, Smithsonian just, or anybody, client just lays out their artifacts and say, here, this is what we have, design a building that accommodates that. But this rarely happens. Oftentimes, these projects, um, the owner, in this case, the Smithsonian, when, when we were hired, they had zero artifacts. So um, they are collecting these things as we are designing. So we are responding to um, these wonderful finds that they get and, and figuring out how to tell the story and, and um, incorporate these uh, into the narrative. This is uh, the actual final photography of that shot I uh, told you earlier. You, you can see the antebellum, Thomas Jefferson, the cotton bales up against the 1960s era and also the, the prison tower in the back. Um, this is another view. So, so really you've dropped down, you've experienced that. Then we, we uh, felt it was important as you come up through history, we did that through a series of ramps. 
so that you can navigate slowly up and sort of um, have time to process um, that what you've experienced prior to taking in more content. So I love this photograph because this is actually a slave cabin that Smithsonian, or a cabin that Smithsonian acquired that was actually built by a free African American. And it's actually a two-story cabin when you go in it. Um, people were really little back then, but uh, it, it's, uh, it's amazing. But this is somebody that built their own home that was very, very proud. And you see that, you know, contrasted against uh, this here is a cabin that was acquired in um, Edisto, South Carolina, that was a, a slave cabin. And so you see freedom and slavery kind of in the, in the same view here. And there was a, a uh, uh, in this very small area, there were like six people that lived in this cabin. So it's uh, incredible. There are other large artifacts, such as a Tuske uh, Tuskegee Airmen's plane that uh, Smithsonian was able to acquire. And then there are these very intimate um, experiences. So it's very important when you're designing these experiences that they are able to accommodate these large moves and large artifacts, but also the very personal um, ones that you have to, you have the space and the ability to get up close to. So this is the um, ballast from a slave ship uh, and that we, that Smithsonian actually found or uh, um, while we were in design that was, uh, it was wrecked off the coast of South Africa. Um, but one of the ways they're able to verify that that ship was in fact a slave ship is because of these ballasts. They were, they were um, weights that were put in the belly of a ship uh, to, to weight the ship so that it could make the journey um, across the Atlantic. And, and that was because human cargo is a lot lighter than material cargo, so they had to incorporate these ballasts to get the uh, ship to operate properly. And then this is something like a, a homemade wallet, so to speak, for lack of a better word, back in that day, that um, slaves would use to carry their papers. They had to have them, or freed slaves. Uh, they had to have their papers on them at all times, so you're able to experience that. And once you come out of that history gallery, um, we reintroduced water, very important, but in this way, it was introduced in a different manner. It was introduced vertically um, in a way that, um, that um, 10 minutes, okay, in a way that streams down in a more cleansing um, environment, um, and those quotes behind by Martin Luther King um, are appropriate for that. Coming out of all of that, you move up through, um, up into the um, uh, building, and we provided these lenses. Remember I told you we always, regardless of where you are, wanted to remind you or frame views um, to particular key areas on the site. This is a lens, we, that's what we call them, um, that frames a perfect view out of uh, one of the galleries above, in this instance the military gallery, to the Washington Monument. And that's that same lens that you see expressed on the exterior of the building. Um, and I'll go through these fairly quickly. The, this is the um, community gallery up above. Um, we have art, the visual arts, um, sports, African American contributions to film. Um, I love this photograph because of um, Chuck Berry's Red Cadillac was another key find that the Smithsonian made. And also, um, most of us know the uh, Bootsy Collins and the, the mothership here and George Clinton. Um, key finds that are, that are really, really fun as you experience those community and cultural galleries. I put a few statistics here just so you can sort of frame um, or have a point of reference for this uh, project. So um, the building's fairly large at 400,000 square feet um, and it, literally uh, took about seven volumes or nearly 2,000 sheets of drawings and uh, you know, almost 6,000 pages of specifications. There were 33 um, design uh, team members that, uh, and, and my role on the project was I was the, the, the lead project manager managing uh, four architecture firms and 31 other consultants. So it was pretty, pretty massive. 
Um, and then here's just some of the statistics on the construction end of things. Um, 72,000 cubic yards of concrete that filled, mostly filled that hole and built um, the, the uh, cores in the building. Uh, an average of 3,600 of those corona panels used on site. So I'm going to just um, speed through the next part really quickly to allow some time for questions. But people after this always ask what's next because um, it's, it's, I told you our practice is about imbuing culture in not only the four walls of buildings that we do but out into the landscape. Because we are, um, because I am in uh, Nashville, I'll quickly share with you briefly um, the Motown Museum that's um, underway, and that's very relevant to the um, National Music, African American Music Museum. But um, only to talk about how um, we mine for these stories. So oftentimes, these projects and the way we, oh, ignore my drop box, it's always full. Uh, <laughs> Uh, the, the way we, um, we, we mine for these stories is through deep stakeholder engagement and deep research about, um, about what these places and people used to be and, and, and what they want to in, in, uh, imbue into the design and also the potential and possibilities that in many cases were lost. In Motown, um, the story does not necessarily start with Barry Gordy. We all know he was a visionary behind Motown, but it was, um, he came from, there were four elements that go into this, a very um, structured family um, that he came out of that, that, uh, that literally was just um, steeped in values and, and the ability and, and the notion to that hard work and values and family matters. A man with the vision and um, A city um, that was uh, an area that um, African, -Americans, African Americans migrated to from the South um, at that time. We, we were talking about the warmth, of, the warmth of Other Suns earlier today, the book that talks about all the areas that um, African Americans left to try to escape what was going on in the South. And, and Detroit was the place of opportunity at the time. And finally, a little house called Hitsville. Uh, and that particular house that Barry Gordy acquired um, was acquired because it was the only house along that street that had a detached garage that he could um, make that wonderful music. So as we look to what was important and, and how we would express such a, such a broad and complex story about Motown and its impact on America, it was the music that in many ways that changed America, um, we, we honed in on all this notion of CDs and the album cover and all of the hits that Motown generated. And, and actually, in many instances, the, the primary colors that, was, that were used to produce the art on those record labels. And then um, we, we sound mapped one song that was revolutionary in its time by Marvin Gaye, What's Going On. And we looked at, tho we looked at those notions and the sound mapping of those, and then said, well, how can we express that in a very subtle way, um, but in a way that moves. Um, music is about movement, so we didn't want anything to be static, so we gave the building a beat, and that's, um, <laughs> and that, and that's Motown as it, as it kind of wraps around here. Um, and how much, a little bit more time? Five minutes? Okay. I um, want to talk to you now about why it's important for us as we, as we take the, our cultural practice beyond. We love doing buildings, right? But there's an opportunity to impact um, the built environment on a macro scale. So <clears throat> we began to look at areas that now um, in the 1950s and 60s, um, there were certain policies during that time. There was a, a culmination of things that happened, policies um, such as urban renewal um, that really did the opposite. Um, they actually ended up removing many people from their homes and, and disenfranchising um, people uh, that, um, that were voiceless at the time. So 
it's that, and also during that time, we were all very much in love with our cars, right? So, so we were building highways as fast as we could, and those highways were ripping through the fabric of many of our cities and, and communities. Um, I'll briefly share with you, his, uh, uh, this is a project that I'm working on. It's one, it is one of my favorite projects right now, but in Greenville, North Carolina, it's one of my favorites because it's close to home. But this is Sycamore Hill Baptist Church. This was a community, a thriving African-American community. Um, so they, they own their own homes, but the most prominent feature in this community was their church. It was something that represented structure and that um, they firmly believed in that community that um, children and everyone that grew up needed to be routed through that church. And most of the people and children that attended that church went on to higher education and went on to be um, very, very um, strong contributors to their community. Um, this is what happened on the urban renewal. Um, it was just wiped out. Um, the community uh, fought hard to preserve the church. Um, they were able to do that for a while. Um, but then that church also fell to um, um, what is presumably arson, and then the church had to be uh, finally destroyed. So we were brought in because this community, um, this, the town now is is redeveloping this and keep in mind this was this really was removal because there was no nothing put back and now finally they're redeveloping it as a park but um, this area here was a bit of a challenge they didn't this is the exact area where the church used to stand there was not really a clear vision for how to commemorate that and so we were hired and again through this process of deep interaction and engagement with the community um, there were certain themes of community, spirituality, that resonated um, history that was prominence, music structure, pride. And so we thought of this notion of this community loved music. People talked about the fact that they would stand outside that church or walk by on a Sunday and you hear this incredible music. But we love, as much as we love music, we understand that music occurs within some type of structure. So this idea of freedom within a structure, um, the fact that they had 22 strong founders that, that stood um, firm and fast um, trying to protect this church. Um, so we looked at the historical a map of, of the existing church and there were key elements. There were prominent areas where, where stained glass was used. Um, there was areas that we looked at that were for gathering uh, the prominent um, area that stood on the corner, entry welcome, and the place that they, um, where the message was preached from the pulpit. And then the areas leading down, they used to baptize people at the river. Um, so we interpreted that um, in, in a way that um, said that we wanted to sort of bring back elements of those, the interpretive walls, the gardens that were there, and the sycamore trees. It was called Sycamore Hill because it had these wonderful sycamore trees. And um, this is our artist's um, rendition now of, of what we're working on, where um, we are pulling back in, in key areas, the notion of stained glass, this is how we envision that bell tower that was um, on the corner, just marking that this was a prominent location, interpreting the area of the sanctuary, how that may have been, and making sure that we're telling the story that people can remember, but that they can relate to in, in, in very modern ways. I think I'm out of time. I would love to look at this, review this one with you. Uh, keep going. Okay, he says I have. He gave me a, what do you call it, a get out of jail free card? Okay, I'll keep going. Um, I, I want to talk to you about Vancouver. Uh, this is, um, and by the way, there was another milestone yesterday, um, other than me getting my fellowship, which was, well, thank goodness. But um, there was a milestone in Vancouver where the city council approved this project um, that has been, it's, it's a huge development. But Vancouver is a city that's very progressive. If anybody's been there, it's a wonderful city if you've spent time there. But one of their um, sort of claim to fame is that they developed Van the city of Vancouver in a way that was very different than many of our cities in the states developed. Um, they did not necessarily take highways 50, 60 years ago and ram them through their cities. They, they really did for that period of time um, 
you know, kind of ran the highways around the, per the uh, perimeter of the city, largely around uh, the waterfront there. Um, but th uh, there was a community called Hogan's Alley, and it's this little community here that's right in the middle of the Northeast Falls Creek. You can see the, the image of that now, the beautiful, uh, um, everybody knows, notable image of uh, Vancouver, Strathconia, um, which was a, a wonderful mix. These were multi-generational, um, uh, multi, uh, multi-ethnicity uh, people that, that lived in these areas. But the black Canadian community in Vancouver is very small. It's less than 1% in the population. And they only, all of the black people in the entire city lived right there. So, um, it, and they lived there because it was, uh, it was also um, close to the railroad and a lot, of the, the, a lot of them were porters that worked on the train and it was just very convenient. Um, but the, the city, um, when they built the viaducts, um, which they, it's their term for highways, when they built those viaducts there, um, they did not route them through the city, but what they did was they, um, they routed the off-ramps right through this neighborhood there. And so this was some of the assets the cult that was in the area, a lot of the businesses. And, but then and everything wasn't all glamorous, right? We have to be honest. There was, this was called Hogan's Alley um, because that is actually a term that is used similar to the way we use Skid Row. It's actually a, a term, a derogatory term. Um, that we have decided to embrace and, and redefine. But um, there was, um, you know, the, uh, this was an actual historic pictures of the, of the uh, significant alley that was routed right here um, through that block. And that was a place of community. So it doesn't matter that dilapidated structures may have been lost. It's the potential of what this community could be today if 50, 60 years later they had remained intact and been able to realize their potential. Um, so we were intrigued by a couple of things here. One is these, um, these power poles that are everywhere in the alley. And people, when we were engaging with them, they have memories of this. And, and the good thing about working on this work today for me is that these people are still alive. A lot of these people you can talk to, these are people that actually watch their homes being destroyed. And these are some of the themes that came out um, in our uh, discussions with them about having a cultural center, not feeling invisible, having that like they have a place and that there's value in organic geometry, very different from the rigor that you see in um, Vancouver and a lot of the, the vertical development. Um, an interior expression that might be very different than an exterior where you're trying to really um, relate to the, um, the city, a little bit the city edges. Passages and storytelling, ways to, to imbue um, what had been lost here, and spaces for social connection. So we took those kind of prevailing themes to always check ourselves as we design against those. Um, and what came out of this is a robust narrative. I won't read it, but this is an actual photograph of, of um, the little girl there is, is one of the the stakeholders that we engage with all the time. This was her home, and she, she remembers it, and this is one of the last photographs she has, and they talked again about the affinity towards uh, porches, passages, and thresholds that were created. Um, so we like the notion of the Vancouver skyline framed against the mountains, which are beautiful, and this idea of porch, again, coming back in, because that was what was important. So we, we, we reestablished Hogan's Alley almost in the exact alignment, but in an organic way. And we pushed and pulled the, the massing here to relate to these notions of the mountains and the skyline and the development that, that is occurring here. And this is taking our, cue, our uh, clues from a lot of what we heard in the community about culturally framed public art, um, urban farming, um, art to tell a, cult, a, a story, storytelling, um, street vendors, all of the things that they wanted um, that were, they didn't want this pristine, over sanitized, glassy development. They wanted something that looked accessible to them and relatable. And so um, where we are now, checking back against those themes, um, this is, uh, renderings that are a couple, couple months old at this point, 
but um, creating an environment where we're able to bring interpretation in. Um, you can see the porter's car, some, some sort of a notion or placeholder that might be there uh, for an art piece, uh, the cultural center, and the, the form of the building bringing back in a lot of what they want to see, the greenery, uh, the mixing of textures, active street engagement, so um, their craft of what they do spilling out onto the street, opening up, not necessarily um, displayed behind a glass storefront. And, um, and finally here, you can see we, this was how we interpreted those H frames. Um, we liked this, this, this ability of, of um, the residents, the tower, the living above, but being able to uh, traverse back and forth in this notion of um, H frames that they were uh, very much uh, able to relate to. And I think I'm gonna have to end it there. And uh, I won't do Charlotte, that's a large one, but uh, maybe next time. Uh, thank you. So I think I'll, we have time for questions. Okay. Hello. Hi. Um, my name is Tiffany Capehart, and uh, your process is fascinating. Can you take us back? to the charrette. Um, you said it was about a week after Barack Obama was elected. Mm -hmm. What did that, how did that election change the conversation and some of the process in designing the, the museum in DC? Yeah, that election actually did change the process. And if you guys didn't hear the question, she was, the question was, um, Oh yeah, you had a mic, so they heard the question. Um, but that, that the process did change. You know, before that, we were we were two years in pre-design, and we were thinking about this museum, working with Lonnie Bunch, working with a client that didn't that didn't have much at that time. So the vision for this was, as always, with um, when we start a lot of cultural work and begin our relationships with clients, the vision was that anything can stop us at any time. Money policy, it could stop us. And I think when that election happened, people just, we, we came to that short, people were just exuberant. Um, and it, it, there was just this level of hope. And I think that that and that, that form and that, that I told you about, everybody was like, yay. Um, that really was, I, I, I would have to say it's undeniably something that um, you know, impacted us and influenced us. Uh, space for rotating exhibits uh, and maybe even, you know, special celebrations. Oh, I'm sorry, that's it. the question was? Rotating exhibits and special celebrations that may be planned in the future. I'm not sure if I understood that. Celebrations? celebrations. Oh, yes, rotating exhibits. I'm sorry, I missed the last part. Uh, yes, yeah, so in the museum, uh, there is a, a um, if you go, it, it, I'm not sure, how many of you have been to the museum, by the way, just so I know my audience. Okay, good number of you. So there is um, a place specially designed for um, special exhibits, rotates huge, it's a massive gallery that we put there. I will tell you that people talk about the only um, less than 15% of Smithsonian's entire content is actually on display in the museum. So even the history gallery, there's some things that will never move. Um, em Emmett Till's casket will never go anywhere. It's there for, you know, forever as long as the museum is there. But there are some things that will marginally rotate out of that. Um, most of the, of the um, content will rotate in the, in the community and history galleries above. Hi, Zena. Hi. Hey, my name is Valerie Franklin. Mm -hmm. I'm an architect, and I have a project. I have a project in D.C., and I'm I'm up there pretty often. And I've always I was like, okay, next time I'm going to the museum. Next mm -hmm. time I'm going to the museum. But by stroke of luck, which was not uh, planned, and uh, everyone would uh, remember back in January we had the snow apocalypse here in yeah. uh, Nashville, yeah. mm -hmm. and my flight was canceled. So uh, I had an extra day in D.C. and I had a chance to to get out to the the museum. Okay. And mm -hmm. so it was me, and um, I loved it. 
Um, mm -hmm. Everything you talked about, I got it. I got, mm -hmm. I got it. You know, I, I saw the angles and, and everything was beautiful. Mm -hmm. uh, but it was also uh, an emotional experience for me, uh, not only for me, but, but for my group uh, mm -hmm. that I was with. And the group that I was with was about a group of 30 strangers. Mm -hmm. And our experience started on an elevator. Mm -hmm. And that's what I want to talk to you about. Mm -hmm. It was the biggest elevator I ever seen in my life. It was like um, the size of a room. Mm -hmm. And it was about 30 something of us on, on this elevator. And it was, it was, it just, you started, this is how we started our experience in yeah. the museum. We got on, we had a whole different attitude when we, we got on. Everybody was talking, was like, ah, you know, mm -hmm. just like excited just to start our tour of the museum. And then we got on this, this elevator and it start taking us down and, and you see the, the, the dates changing mm -hmm. and we went down 400 years. Mm -hmm. And I, I just, I venture to say that we, we all got off to that elevator a different way than, mm -hmm. we, than when, we, when we got on. Mm -hmm. I mean, we were humbled, um, the, our attitude was more somber um, and we actually, you know, it was me and a group of strangers, but we pretty much traversed the rest of the museum together. Wow. And so did you imagine, and I know you weren't able to fit it into your presentation, mm -hmm. but did you ever imagine that that elevator would have, you know, that effect on people in the museum? Yeah, it's, it's, it's amazing that you ask about the elevator, which, by the way, we're all designers, most of us here, so I could talk about the fact that, that the elevator almost got VE'd out. And, and we fought for that. That is a completely custom elevator and a lot of investment including financially, went, went into creating something so huge and so custom. And um, we felt strongly that, um, first of all, it's the size that it's in, that it is because we felt that if a group of, of, of school children, and, um, which is about 30, a school bus is 30, that they should be together experiencing that. And, and the timeline, you start from 1980 and you go down to 1400s. Um, it, it was intended to just kind of provide a way to get you in the right framework because you are, um, you have to think about that you're experiencing people's lives, you know, and it's not necessarily starts off as a hee hee ha ha chatty moment. So it's, so it's, it's a way to transition you into and prepare you for what you're, you're coming into. Um, and, and I want to say something else. I always say this uh, from uh, Ilani Bunch says this, the museum is not about victims and perpetrators. And that, that should never be like a sense or feeling. It's about finally telling a, a, a story, the story, the truth, um, in a credible way by a very authentic institution. And that is the reason why we, co we constantly um, balance telling, um, you know, not, not being, be, being unapologetic about telling the truth, but understanding that um, there, were, there were people who fought and worked hard on all sides to get us to where we are today. And, 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 um, and that is why it ends, begins that way, but it ends in a celebratory way. I think that's it. Thank you. So thank much. you. Uh -huh.